I'm going to record on the Okay, so thank you very much, Juliana Rangel, for joining us today uh, for Live Bees. We're very excited to have you here and uh, talking to us uh, from Texas, which is terrific. It's seven o'clock over there, which I now know, not six o'clock. Um, I'd like to start by acknowledging the Palawa people as the traditional owners and ongoing custodians of Lutruwita, where this is being recorded today. Uh, we honour their history and deep connection to this land and its waters, which, which were never ceded, and we pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, so thank you, Juliana, again, for coming to join us. Um, we are recording this to be looked at and viewed later by people who are unable to join us live today. Um, I'd like to introduce Juliana with her extensive bio, which I was just commenting on before we hit the record button. And there have been many requests from our community to speak with Juliana. Um, so I'd like to start by just running through her bio. Juliana was born in Columbia, South America, and obtained a BS in Ecology, Behaviour and Evolution in 2014 from the University of California, San Diego. In 2010, she obtained a PhD in Neurobiology and Behaviour from Cornell University in Ithaca, uh, New York. She was an NSF postdoctoral research fellow from 2010 to 2013 at North Carolina State University. In January 2013, Juliana became assistant professor of apiculture in the Department of Entomology at Texas A&M University in College Station, Texas. She was promoted to associate professor with tenure in 2018. Her research program focuses on the biological and environmental factors that affect the reproductive quality of honeybees, the behavioral ecology and population genetics of feral colonies, and the quality and diversity of honeybee nutrition in a changing landscape. She is an active member of the Texas Beekeepers Association and has spoken to dozens of beekeeping associations across the USA and internationally. Juliana teaches the courses Honey Bee Biology, Introduction to Beekeeping, and Professional Grant and Contract Writing. Since 2014, she has been the coach of TAMU's undergraduate and graduate teams of the Entomology Games at the Branch and National Games of the Entomological Society of America, earning first and second place nationally four years in a row. She is the 2022 Pre Vice President of the Southwestern Branch of the ESA and is the past elected Chair of the National ESA's Diversity and Inclusion Committee. She previously served as the elected chair of her department faculty advisory committee and has been part of several committees at the departmental college and university level. In 2021, she received the James I. Hamilton Memorial Award, which was established by the Eastern Apicultural Society of North America to recognize research excellence in apiculture. She also received the 2010 John G. Thomas Award for Meritous Service from the Texas Beekeepers Association for her contributions to the apiculture industry in the state. She received the 2019 Dean's Award for Excellence in Diversity and the 2016 Dean's Award for Excellence in Early Career Research from TAMU's College of Agricultural and Life Sciences. She also received the 2018 Outstanding Achievement in Mentoring Award for the Entomology Graduate Student Association. She was 2014 President and 2013 Vice President of the American Association of Professional Apiculturists. Now I can tell you, I probably need to uh, take a deep breath after reading all of that out. So I'll have a little glass of water and just again, welcome Juliana to the stage. And I think Juliana, this might be a good chance for you to tell us a little bit about your beekeeping journey, please. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for this wonderful invitation. Um, incidentally, I have a colleague who is from Tasmania and we met today and so I was very happy to tell him that we were chatting, even if it was just remotely, but um, mm -hmm. I have never been um, to your island, but I have been to Australia a couple of times and absolutely I'm in love with, um, with that uh, part of the world. So thank you again for inviting me. Um, yeah, that was a long introduction. Let me tell you a bit about how I got into bees, basically. Um, I am, as 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 you said, I'm I'm originally from Colombia, and um, I finished graduated high school in Colombia. Went to university for for a few semesters, and then moved to to the U.S. with my family. And I went to um, a technical community college for the first couple of years. When I transferred to the University of California, San Diego, I 
I mean, the, the doors were wide open for me to do research. I really wanted to get into research. There's no such thing or very little of undergraduate research where I'm from in Colombia. So I just really wanted to get involved and I knew I wanted to do something with biology. So I um, reached out to a few professors and two of whom replied saying they wanted help. One was this guy working in neuroscience with um, studying um, plasticity of the frontal uh, cortex of the brain in rats. And the other one was this guy that uh, had just started his laboratory uh, studying honeybee communication. And I don't know if you you probably have never heard of the first one, Dan Feldman, but um, he's also very, very well known in his field. Um, but the second one you may have heard of, his name is uh, Dr. James Nye, who uh, just got, uh, has made the cover of the magazine Science because oh, of wow. their recent discoveries uh, on the Waggle Dance and how um, social learning is very important for um followers of the Waggle Dance to, mm -hmm. to learn the proper way of, of uh, reading the referential communication um, aspect of the Waggle Dance. So anyway, I encourage you to read that because it just came out. So he had just been in his lab for like six months when um, he answered my email saying he wanted some help. At the time he was studying a similar, he wanted to see if Stingless honeybees in the genus um, Melipona, kind of in the cl closest tribe to uh, the Apini, which are the Meliponini. Um, you you guys have Melipona in in um, Australia, and we have them in Central and South America. He wanted to see if this one species um, of Melipona, well, a, actually a couple can use referential communication, like the waggle dance. If there's something similar to the waggle dance in seamless honeybees, and the more advanced ones anyway. Um, and so he was working at the time in Brazil and he wanted someone to help him with, first to decode some of the sounds that he had recorded. So it was all laboratory, tedious work of, of sound analysis on a software. But I really enjoyed it. I thought it was really fascinating. I'd never heard of stingless honeybees mm -hmm. or that they make sounds that could potentially communicate distance to a food source. So when I um, did my fair amount of, of work in the laboratory, he, he saw that I guess I, I was serious about it. And he then invited me to go with him to Brazil to actually study the the species in its wild setting and um, record sounds and other things and perform experiments. So I was there for a couple of months with him and that's how I got introduced to the world of bees. And I never switched ever since. I actually kept the job at the, I took both jobs. One was, this one was for credit. The other job at the neuroscience lab was for pay, and that's how I made my money. As an undergraduate student, I worked as a research assistant in that lab until I graduated. Uh, but I didn't really, you know, the 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 PI, the the mentor, when I was applying for grad school, I told him I wanted to work with bees, and he said, "Are you sure? Because you've only worked with rats in our lab and bees in the other lab. Like, have you considered any other systems?" And I said, "No, I really want the bee route." It's really fascinates me because it allowed me to be outdoors. Mm -hmm. um, at the time I was working with bees in South America, so it was close to where I was from. Um, and it was answering really cool biological questions. So then I, it was time to apply for graduate school and um, I applied to a, a couple of places um, and one of which was Cornell University. And naively I did because I was so focused on, on studying with uh, studying stingless bees, honeybees. I didn't really know much about Apis mellifera or the most influential scientists, bee, honeybee scientists 
at the time. So when I got invited to join Tom Seeley's laboratory, it was not to study Apis mellifera. He actually took me on to study communication in stingless honeybees, something that he had, knew very little about. Mm. So yeah, it was interesting because, you know, if I had been wanting to study Apis mellifera, maybe maybe he wouldn't have been interested in my questions or something else maybe would have happened, but this stars aligned. And I ended up working, studying um, under Tom Seeley, but really my own independent project on, on stingless bee communication. And I did that for in Costa Rica for a couple of years. And then things were not moving as fast as, as we needed it to for to complete a dissertation. So we started thinking about other projects and that's how I got involved in uh, swarming um, um, behavior in honeybees. Yes. And then I guess the rest is history. So I've been working with Apis Melif with honeybees, stingless honeybees since 2001. Hmm. And Apis mellifera since 2005 or six, something like that. Yeah. Um, and of course, I, I never look back. I, I hold deep appreciation for stingless honeybees, but I kind of went a different route and I um, haven't done much stingless bee research uh, since. It's really interesting, Juliana, because your pathway to what you're doing now is not a typical pathway, I suppose. And to have that privilege to study under Tom like that would have just been an incredible experience. And I'm sure you still have a good relationship with him because of the work that you're now doing with um, uh, European honeybees. Um, and, right. you know, and the work that you are doing with European honeybees is so groundbreaking. And I'd really like to give you an opportunity to talk a little bit about the research that you've done because it's in more than one area you you work in um the quality of, of feral bee colonies i suppose that's the swarming arm of what you were talking about you also mm -hmm. talk about bee nutrition and you also talk about reproductive cycles so can you give us a little bit of information about the research that you do absolutely so my the, the topic that is dear and near to my heart is reproduction because i've been working on reproduction for so long studying the behavioral ecology of swarming with Tom Seeley. Um, then I moved uh, to North Carolina for um, um, a postdoctoral research fellowship for three years working with David Carpey at North Carolina State. And we were trying to look for the triggers of um, premature queen supersedure. And so this um, was more at the Queen quality side of things, not just um, colony fissioning and colony level of reproduction, but this is more at the um, at the reproductive female side of things. And I've been interested in that topic ever since. What are the factors that affect the reproductive quality of honeybee queens? And more or equally important, drones, which have been um, overlooked maybe up until now by by a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, but so that, that reproduction is my personal favorite topic to study. I've done studies independently for years, but then also with my graduate students now. But I generally, my laboratory explores the factors that affect bee, honeybee health in general. And so students come with uh, certain degrees of knowledge about bee husbandry and certain either previous experience with bees or with biology that informs their preferences for studying. And so we together come up with, with interesting questions that haven't been answered. And so I kind of give them flexibility um, up to a certain degree. If we have a grant that needs to be fulfilled, then that's kind of, we have to work on that grant. But other students have not been under grants and so they've had kind of part blank as, as to what they want to study. Mm -hmm. So. One student, Myra Dickey, she came in saying that she was really, really interested in studying um, what here in the US you might refer to as feral bees or wild bees, mm -hmm. which are of course not native, um, 
honey bees, Apis mellifera, that live in feral, unmanaged conditions. And I just happened to have inherited a site in South Texas by my predecessor um, that had looked at the Africanization process of bees in Texas, because this was the first state into which Africanized bees migrated in the US. And so that side has a beautiful population of unmanaged bees that have never been treated for varroa or treated in any way by beekeepers and they, they still thrive under these um, unmanaged settings, typical of, of any other forested areas with, with feral bees, but most importantly, it has been thoroughly mapped there's very few of those locations that have been mapped in the U.S. Um, Tom Seeley has the very famous Arnott Forest in upstate New York, which are very different from some of the bees that we, we just started a collaboration with a um, reserve in the near the San Francisco area in California. And they actually call themselves Apis arborea. So it's like, it's not a, it's not a, scientific name but they call it that like the, the bees and trees basically trees, yeah yeah uh so that that's really cute and uh they they study they map um feral bees in that in that forested area and then we have our forested area which is very different it's south texas chaparral very um thick brush no tall trees difficult to to get a hold of these bee trees, but um, uh, we've we've managed to be to continue to expand the mapping of the bee trees and exploring what's happening to these bees. So, um, what are the levels and types of diseases that they harbor? Uh, what's the genetic makeup? Are they mostly Africanized or mostly European or a combination of both? Hmm. And so that that's a really interesting topic of interest. Of research, not just because it is helps you know to conserve in terms of conservation biology, preserve those bees that live in those unmanaged settings, but it explains how Apis mellifera has been able to live and thrive in certain conditions without human intervention, in spite of varroa destruction. Yeah, really um, interesting. Very really interesting. interesting. The last um last uh, interview we did was with bees uh um bees for development in the UK and they spoke exactly ah, about yeah. this topic. So I spoke to Jenny Handley and Janet Luore, and they uh -huh. were talking about the less intervention they found. The less intervention that communities had, the more the bees survived, and not just survived but thrived, and also mm -hmm. the less disease they had. And so that was really interesting to listen to that. And you are reflecting from a research angle exactly right. that what what they have observed um on a practical and application level yeah there's the beacon of genetic diversity of specific genotypes that are better able to uh to survive without human intervention and those are these survivor bees and each location let's say in the US or different eco regions will have different genotypes of these bees that live um, unmanaged. So, you know, in the Arnott forests are mostly of the N lineage or the C lineage, whereas so the Mediterranean or um, Northern European lineage, whereas in our area, they're mostly A lineage, so Africanized, um, but they still have a lot of European um, genes in them and so it's the perfect combination for them to be able to thrive in this particular ecotype in South Texas. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've found that these bees have um, lower levels across the board of, of everything we've looked into, um, nosema, deformed wing virus, acute bee paralysis viruses. We, we did a screening of eight common honeybee associated viruses and they are uh, either not infected or, or very infected at very low levels. So um, something are about the bees, their genotype. Are the bees more aggressive? They than, are. So yeah, that's that was one my of next their question. strategies. They have smaller colonies. 
they they abscond uh, when perturbed or when they don't have enough food. So they just pick up and go. And in doing so, it, and they swarm more frequently. So either when they abscond or when they swarm, um, that uh, presumably reduces the uh, varroa levels because then only the adults are leaving with mites on that are on the during the dispersal phase. Yep. Whereas they're leaving behind all the mice that are in the reproductive phase, which hmm. depending on the time of year might be the highest level of varroa in a colony. So yeah. uh plus they're more aggressive, they have um, more common like more um frequent and um kind of more active grooming behavior hmm. that hmm. they help uh, get rid of of mites, you know, uh, something like the um, ankle biters. Yeah. In situation, they have uh, grooming, a lot of grooming. So yeah. those are some of those strategies, and so they they help reduce the the prevalence of all of these um, pathogens. It's really interesting that research, Juliana, because, you know, as you know, we're, we have a varroa incursion in New South Wales at the moment in Australia, and the way that it's being handled is very different to the kind of live with it strategy. People are now starting to talk about a live with it strategy. Um, I'm interested in how the research that you're doing in this space, how you see it impacting the world, where does it lead to in your mind? What's the next thing that we, that it can be applied and how will it help us across the world? So I'm actually right now collaborating with a scientist in Macquarie University yeah. in Australia, uh, Dr. Mary Whitehouse, who is leading a group of um, bee um, scientists from across the world. Um, Liz Frost uh, is from Australia is working, but then we have people from New Zealand, um, uh, have myself, and then Dr. Whitehouse is an expert in integrated pest management, but not in honeybees. He works on uh, pests of cotton and other agroecosystems. But the, he comes from this background of IPM. Um, and so knowing about the uh, relatively new incursion of varroa destructure in the Australian um, continent and knowing that of the lessons learned from places like the US where we depended so heavily on harsh chemicals mm -hmm. and now Varroa became resistant to pretty much almost all the harsh chemicals we've applied except for the current one, Amitraz. Um, and we're now reporting uh, Amitraz resistance in a lot of um, uh, populations of Varroa across the US. It's, it's very concerning. So coming from, I think the, the this group that I am associated with um, is the way that things should be done everywhere and uh, things that we didn't do in the US, uh, but that you guys have a lot of opportunity to learn from is to have, I would dare to say not an IPM paradigm, but an IPPM paradigm, Integrated Test and Pollinator Management uh, Program. Yep. Um, informed uh, on the principles of IPM um, and from the lessons learned of countries that did not use IPM um, methods as heavily as they should have um, to better control the devastating might. And um, so the forefront, I think, is, is interdisciplinary work, including people from other fields mm -hmm. that have worked with very persistent and damaging pests and parasites to see how they did it right, not relying so heavily on harsh chemicals. Um, yes. And our work in showing that there's very severe non-target effects, sub-lethal effects of miticide mm -hmm. on the reproductive health of queens and drones brings well, on the point that we're trying to protect the honeybee by killing the mites that attack them, but using, it's almost like chemotherapy, you know, you're killing good and bad cells. Yeah. And if you don't, and it's, it's, it's very difficult to, to not damage good 
themselves in the process of doing so. And that's kind of how what we're doing a lot of years. We've noticed our work shown that exposing queens and drones during development to miticides lowers their reproductive quality, lowers sperm viability, lower egg laying capacity, lower attraction of queens um, by uh, the workers. So they don't tend to the queen as much, and so they don't feed her as much. All of these have very specific and dramatic downstream effects on the colony level, um, showing reduction in egg laying capacity by 20 to 40% means that you have 20 to 40 percent fewer workers in a month yeah. uh, that will then become 20 to 40 percent fewer foragers that can go and collect. And I guess you can extrapolate out further and say, I'm guessing here, that a smaller hive colony doesn't overwinter quite so well. Would that be absolutely. a fair? Yeah, 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 absolutely. So it's just these very, very severe and multifaceted downstream effects just from um, one of the things that, so if you ask beekeepers in the United States, what are the top five causes of colony death? death? And this year we've actually, we're due to come to get the, the reports from the colony loss management sometime in um, May. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've heard that the losses have been really high this year because it was so wet over the winter. Yeah, anecdotally, um, that's ask, coming through. Yeah, yes. I'm seeing it on Facebook pages and groups. Everyone's yes. reporting terrible overwintering in the US and and yes. and the UK too. I think so. Oh, really? It'll be interesting to yeah. see how yeah how how that unfolds. Yeah, and so you always see varroa or PMS. <laughs> yes. It's not our PMS. It's the uh, uh, parasitic mite syndrome. Yeah. Um, Poor nutrition, pesticide exposure, poor queen. Mm. Mm. And that's, uh, a, it, yeah. And so in the diseases, those could be associated with um, varroa, mostly. Mm -hmm. So um, I look at that list and then I start thinking, well, where can I make the most contribution it would be in the top factors that affect uh, colony losses or that are causing colony loss. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that um, climate change and um, habitat loss are probably a very, very important aspect uh, to look into that we're actually not looking into as much, not with Apis mellifera, um, that we should uh, research further because things are going to continue to to change. There's going to be erratic weather patterns uh, that have caused these floods, hurricanes, droughts, and the bees are having to be exposed to those on top of those other things that I just told you. It's just, a, it's a surprise that they're still doing okay. So in the U.S., the um, We'll see what the losses are this year, but the numbers have kind of remained steady at around 2.7, 2.8 million managed colonies. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not nearly enough uh, colonies for what we need for an increasing um, acreage of, of uh, bee pollinated crops. And that's yeah. all around and the what, world. What's generally in the US, what's their percentage of losses over winter generally? So here they start, so the short answer is between 30 and 40 percent, uh, but about 10 years ago, the Bee Informed Partnership, um, which is the one that puts together the Colony Law Survey, they also started reporting or asking beekeepers to report their summer loss because mm -hmm. they started to notice that they don't have to wait until the winter for their colonies to die. They were dying over the summer. So... Mm -hmm. Uh, either lack of nutrition or they came sick after their pollination um, route. And so um, they started reporting their summer de death and their overwintering death. And so if you combine those together, the annual loss 
can be more than 40% in some years. That uh, is, is huge. More than twice the percentage that beekeepers deem acceptable, which ranges between 14 and 18%, depending on the year. Mm. When they know that they're going to have really bad years, they kind of say, I, they would be okay with a little higher loss, but it's always more than twice that number, the, the percent loss. And so it's, I not a, it's not sustainable, right? No, of course not. I mean, especially it doesn't matter whether you're small scale or large scale, that's a lot of bees to be replacing. And when you're looking at bees as the key pollinators in an ag agricultural sector, how do you get that pollination to happen? I'm noticing you've got, I'm guessing they're almond trees behind you, Juliana, in your backdrop. That's right, yes. So your almonds, your almonds flowering season will be happening, I imagine, now or in the next now, couple of weeks? It just yeah. actually just, yeah, it, um, some might be blooming late, but a lot of the pollination already happened. Yeah, happened and so... Like February to mid-March or so. Oh, uh, okay. And most of the bees in the country get taken to almonds yeah pollination and so if you're talking about 30 to 40 percent loss of hives over that winter then trying to come out to do the pollination you would have nothing and I imagine with your research through and let's have a bit perhaps have a bit of a chat about bee nutrition now um sure. you know bees come out of winter stressed um if they've already gone in quite low colony number they come out quite stressed to go and feed on the almonds can you tell us a little bit about that please Juliana yeah so um, imagine that you are uh, taken on a bus across the country, um, maybe with just a couple of stops by your rest, um, but a long haul with a bunch of people that might be sneezing on you, um, eating weird, you know, packaged foods, whatever, and then you get to uh, the other side of the country and then you get put in one building together, everyone is together and eating and and living in close contact with each other. And then they only get uh, chicken nuggets hmm. or no, let's say French fries. That's all you're going to eat for the next two weeks. Yeah. It's a little, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's um, not exactly the same, but the bees are being offered only almond pollen after having been hauled across the country to these fields where they're interacting with bees from other colonies that might be sick. Um, and so the stress of just getting uh, transported is already high. They might be getting sick from, from uh, robbers and, and uh, drifters. And they're only eating one monofloral pollen that only has a certain uh, amino acid and, and fatty acid profile. Mm. And then that's all they eat. On top of that, the farmers need to protect their crop from other pets, from pests and parasites. And so especially fungicides, they have to apply a lot of fungicides, especially when it's really wet out in the California orchards. And so a lot of work is being done and one a uh, really important work from my former student, Adrian Fisher. He's now at Arizona State University. He's showing, when you look at sublethal effects of, of things like pesticides, most of the studies um, are very short-term studies, maybe within a week or two weeks after exposure at the most. But they're showing that fungicides are used in almond agroecosystems, mm. um, cause detrimental effects at the colony level, not two weeks after, but like two, two to three months after. Mm -hmm. So if you stop looking at a week or two, you don't see any changes. But what they notice is that colonies started dwindling in population three months after they had been exposed to the fungicide. Mm -hmm. And so that is probably one of the reasons why we see high mortality over the summer, is that a lot of these colonies that get taken to monocultures uh, get exposed to chemicals that we would think that don't have um, mode of action in insects. And some, some of them, we don't understand the mode of action, mm -hmm. but they definitely do synergize with all of the other things like insecticides, um, plus the stress from, from the migratory 
route and the and the high density of colonies. So yeah. it's it's uh, I know a lot of beekeepers that have chosen not to take bees to almonds anymore because they come out so weak from yeah. from California. But the dollar amount, you know, is very enticing. I, I just read today, you know, from the American Honey Producers Association, their uh, little newsletter uh, from from the president saying that the farmers were so desperate to get any bees that they were taking even two framers. They were mm -hmm. taking two, fr two framer nukes um, as a unit and paying for those just to get any bees um, because wow. they they were so short so you, so if there's a dollar sign in front you know yeah and at the end of the day they have to feed their families and pay their employees yeah um they might just have to go with it anyway even though they know that down the road it might cause a lot of their colonies to die and i suppose for beekeepers in america i'm not sure what it's like for you but here certainly we've had a big battle with um imported honey and imported honey flooding our markets and polluting our our streams. Um, we've also had uh, people fighting about, you know, Chinese honey, uh, sugar syrup being used in honey. Similar issue for you in the States, I imagine. Very similar. So adulterated yeah. honey and dumping of honey from countries that should not have any, um, any permit to import honey. Yeah. So um, China is one of them. Millions of pounds of honey have been um, caught at the border, and so they're really sneaky because they and they, and I, they probably do the same in Australia. Um, they either take it to a country first that where we do allow importation from, and then they take it through that route into the U.S. Yeah. Um, then you do the microscopic analysis of the honey and look up for, for the pollen and you have to find the pollen from blooming plants that belong to the country where it's accepted, acceptable to bring the honey from. So what they do is they either add pollen to the honey, filter out all the honey uh, pollen from the original source so they don't know that it's coming from an illegally uh, procured country add pollen from the legally procured country and trying to just circumvent all of the um all of the uh um the regulations that are yeah. put in place to prevent this dumping from happening it continues to happen but um the america american honey producers association is doing a lot of very active um uh, um, you know, uh, uh, lobbying with our um, legislators, yeah. especially in Washington D.C., Capitol Hill, to to allow or to prevent this importation from happening. the The price of honey has gone up a little bit, mm -hmm. which is good for the beekeeper, uh, but we still have a lot of dumping and adulteration. It's happen. a big problem. It's a big problem. Uh, yeah. We still have that issue here as well. Um, I know recently in New Zealand, a shipment of manuka honey was rejected in, I think, Germany because of the levels of glyphosate that were in the honey. And then I suspect it may have gone through to other countries. We don't know where. Yeah. Germany may have rejected it, but honey's not uh, countries not testing for glyphosate would have allowed it in. I suspect Australia may be one of those countries because we do use glyphosate so prolifically. Um, and in go just going back to your Varroa mite discussion, one of the interesting um, discussions that are happening here with trying to control the Varroa mite is fipronils being used to poison all of the pollinators um, and all the bees. And I think what people perhaps don't realise is that it's a non-discriminant pesticide, that it will kill everything that it touches. Um, and what that means for our pollinator networks here is quite, it's quite frightening, particularly in that Newcastle area. Um, mm -hmm. And, and you know, the concern by many people who are beekeepers and not just beekeepers, environmentalists, the community more broadly is what will, will we be left with and what does that mean for the future? I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about pollinator networks and how European honeybees are a part of that pollinator network and what mm -hmm. happens when those, when they're fractured. Yeah, that's a very controversial topic. Um, yeah. 
if you're speaking just to a beekeeper audience, of course, we are stewards of Apis mellifera and um, we're fascinated by it and a lot of people's livelihoods depend on it, but we acknowledge in the US that it is not a native species. It's, um, it's an introduced species. And in some areas, depending on its density, it may um, interact negatively with the native bee population. And there have been some studies. It's the I think the jury's still out in terms of um, are honeybees neutral, beneficial, or or um, causing detriment to the native bee population. And I think the reason why there's no consensus is because it's on a case by case scenario, depending on the um, ecosystem that you are looking into. So if there's some preserved lands, uh, reserves, um, national parks that have endemic plants and endemic pollinators, um, it's probably not a great idea to place high density of honeybees nearby. One of the reasons why um, it's Con well, many of the one of the many reasons why that might be controversial is that um, we as beekeepers don't keep bees in the density that honeybees are supposed to live uh, as in the in the wild setting. They have a much lower density because they need to. They're competing for resources, and so the more spread out they are in free cavities, the better chances each colony has of obtaining food. Um, but we keep colonies in incredibly um, unnatural and high density. So hundreds of colonies in, in an acre or hectare. Um, and so that definitely doesn't help the n natural ecosystem, especially if we have habitat fragmentation, urbanization, very little food available for the bees. And that's where food supplementation comes into play. If you're a beekeeper, you're um, hoping that your conscientious actions will help improve your bees health, nutritional health, and also the health of the pollinators around you. Because if you're depleting all the food from the um, natural forest um, by having so many honeybees eating them, then uh, your native population is suffering because they're not getting access to a lot of food. So honeybees, Apis mellifera, is an important part of our pollinator network. I argue that without Apis mellifera, we would not have the amount, the sheer amount of food that is required mm -hmm. um, to feed our growing population in the United States and probably in the developed world. But I also acknowledge that it is an introduced species. And so in certain conditions, uh, it may not be as beneficial to have really high density of honeybees. So it's kind of a yeah. pros and cons kind of thing. Um, and but they also serve as cannery in the coal mine kind of um, um, uh, actors because if they're not doing well, if they're malnourished, if um, you know if they have a lot of diseases, and let's say you're looking into a feral population, it might inform you as to potentially the health of the local native pollinator community. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Juliana, it's interesting. And I think it harks back a little bit to the question I haven't asked, which was about gaps in research, but I think you've touched on that through climate change and perhaps um, native pollinators. So thank you for that. Absolutely, um, yeah. native pollinator, well, interactions between honeybees and native pollinators the, um, and Definitely climate change because um, every subspecies of Apis mellifera in its native range has um, evolved in its native range to withstand the select, you know, the pressures from uh, environmental factors, including average amount of rainfall, average temperature when the spring starts and when it ends, uh, when the winter comes and there's, um, you know, where are the lowest temperatures? But 
and, and so our populations became are, are kind of well adapted to those circumstances. But with mm. climate change, this is all mm. changing. And so you're seeing the changing phenology of blooming plants that may be blooming earlier in the year or later in the year than when they were supposed to. And so they yeah. may leave a gap in in a, in the food that the pollinators were expecting at that time of year. And that's, that's a huge problem. Well, I'm um, not yet. With, and, and also with climate change, not just uh, uh, latitudinally, but also altitudinally. So you may see, and there may not always be for the worst. You may have an abundance of plants in a region that you didn't see before because it was too cold in that area. But now temperatures are warmer. That plant is now becoming more available in, in, in areas where it wasn't. And it becomes an open um, niche for, for bees to, to forage. But it's, it's absolutely an under-studied um, realm. We, yeah, we've had yeah, three, three years of La Nina here in Australia. And in Tasmania, that's compressed our bee season from you know, five, four, five months down to three months, which has been horrific. We've had, I keep some of my bees in the leatherwood. I've had a terrible leatherwood season because of exactly what you're talking about. Flowers, not not flowering at all. Um, it's 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 been a real challenge for us um, out here. Now we are starting to get some questions from our guests who have joined us, but before we answer them towards the end, I th there's five questions we always ask Juliana, our, our guests on the show. Um, so the first question is best advice for happy bees. Uh, proper food, proper food. Keep keep honey on. So don't be greedy. Uh, leave your bees with enough honey um, that they could hopefully overwinter without you feeding them sucrose or worse yet high fructose corn syrup because you took all of their honey from them. So keep them happily fed, um, hopefully with real pollen and real honey. Don't be so greedy if you can afford not to. So, but Thank uh, you. Uh, you know, the level of, of um, better to give them something than nothing. But if you have your druthers, do it properly, real food or or happy bees. Okay, so best advice for new beekeepers? Read and attend workshops and watch webinars, hopefully more um, a mix of um, fellow beekeepers, but also scientists, people yeah. who are doing the hard science uh, because there's a lot of snake oil being offered out there and uh, there's so many, I mean, so many opinions, probably just as many as there are beekeepers out there. Um, and some advice may not be the best advice. So getting informed, being um, always willing to learn, and then maybe get your bees after you feel that you had enough reading and attending workshops under your belt as possible. Wise words. Prevent you from some heartache and expense that you may have could have prevented if you knew more about what you were doing. So if you're really itchy to get bees, if you belong to a club, which I highly recommend, then maybe work with your mentor's bees first or your club bees before you get your own. Because you should be conscientious as to what you're doing to and with the bees. Thank you. Um, best bee-friendly plant? Well, this one is um, biased for because of where I live. So am I allowed to share the screen? No. Of course. Can I Can I allow you to do that? Or you yeah, can you have to um, hit below where it says share screen. It could be something that says multiple, multiple people. Multiple can... participants. Yeah. yeah. I've just clicked that. So you should be able to now. For this, I'll, I'll mention this one later but this one is my favorite it's called the texas vitex um, and it produces this wonderful um purple flower and 
even when nothing grows in Texas, because it's so, um, at least where I am, it's, it's the clay is, is, is really difficult to get roots started because when it rains, nothing drains down. Mm -hmm. um, this flower is amazing. They call it Texas lilac or Texas. It's um, beautiful. Or chaff tree. And I have 10 of these in my backyard. It grows maybe two feet per year. I mean, it's kind of weedy, but um, but it, when it has big roots, it actually can get quite chunky. So it's not, I wouldn't call it a, it's a large shrub or a small tree. That's exactly what I was going to say. It's right here. It's like in between. Yeah. Uh, it can grow really high, you know, maybe 10 feet um, uh, tall. But um, it's the best bee friendly plant in my area it's beautiful a, a lilac yeah thank you that's gorgeous i'm not sure we can get that in australia but i've written it down so i'm going to look that up and i'll make some notes vitex. when i post this do vitex. we get it here i don't know if you can get vitex you can look into yeah. this genus to see if there's anything I will. like it because it's amazing i will look thank you for that and your favorite honey juliana <laughs> i really <laughs> like manuka honey <laughs> yeah i really like um well the one that i that i uh have tasted so far is yeah some of my Man favorites. yeah i, I think like i like tasty strong honey yeah. um the honey that we produce here at the lab it's called aggie honey is wildflower and it's really dark and really yeah. rich so i like rich honey rich well i might see if i can send you out some leatherwood if you haven't tried um tasmanian oh. leatherwood I'll see if I can no. get some out. That would be fantastic. Yep. I'll do my um, best to get some to you. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That would be great. Yeah. All Maybe right. Because we do tastings for students yeah. and outreach group, and they have never seen honey from other parts of the All Right. We'll keep an eye on your mailbox. Let alone. Then. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Um, and my last one, your favorite beekeeping hack, Juliana. So my beekeeping, my favorite beekeeping hack is one that I came across just by luck. We we're in the entomology department, and so we have a very high large insect collection, mm. and like a museum. And they were getting rid of these holders. They were made of wood. They looked very similar to a honeybee frame, um, like like a Langstroth hive frame, but more like uh, for a honey super type of hive, and they use it to store insect specimens. So it's almost like a rack made of wood. It's almost perfect. I mean, there's very little you have to do to make it into a, a banking unit. To oh, bank queen. So oh, the, the dimensions are just perfect to put your queen cages into and then put that into a, a, a banking um, colony. So Perfect. those little frames. So, and I every time, I don't know why they get rid of them, but they do sometimes and they just, they don't toss them in the trash. They just leave a box saying free. Yeah. And every time I see them, they have groups of like 40 or 50 out there. So I grab them because we have, at my lab, we hold an annual uh, queen rearing workshop. And so I place one in each person's bag because they've been so useful to us. They can probably um, use them as well for banking queens. It's great. Thank you for that. Um, now, Juliana, before we head to the questions, if people want to stay in touch with you, what's the best way that they can contact you? So obviously via email. So I'm going to um, uh, write it in the chat. Um, yeah, sure. And it's jwrangle at tamu.edu. But we, Thank you. the best way is we have a very active Facebook page. Oh, great. And it's just Tamu Honeybee Lab, and uh, so Texas A and M University or Tamu, and we have over fifty, almost fifty five hundred followers from around mm -hmm. the world. Um, wow! Because I've done so many talks nationally and internationally. Um, there we have people from all over that have joined our our Facebook page, and so that's where we post all of our latest research. Mm -hmm. Who is coming up with presentations where we travel to give talks, but not just our research, like the, our colleagues' best work, 
um, is showcased on our Facebook page. So that's the best way that you uh, can learn about what we're doing and what's coming up. Right. Thank you, Juliana. And, um, and incidentally, I wanted also, this is another way to hear from us is if you go to this page, I want to make a, a pitch for the at home beekeeping webinar series. Because if you guys like, you know, free content that you can watch at your leisure, just like what you're doing right now, we started this a couple of years ago during the COVID pandemic. And it was mm -hmm. called Stay at Home Beekeeping webinar series because people really wanted some content, but they couldn't leave their house. So then we, it became so successful that we changed the name. It's based out of the Auburn University, Alabama Cooperative Extension. But basically the last Tuesday of each month from 6.30 to 7.30 p.m. Uh, Central Time, which is my time. So it would be roughly the same time that your talk is being yeah, recorded right now. Yeah. It would be your morning. And you yep. can watch it online or free live, both via Zoom or Facebook. Yeah. Or you can watch it on Facebook up to two weeks after it was given live. Right. And so here, and, and if you go, you just Google at home, beekeeping webinar series, it'll tell you who is the presenter for that month. Like Oh, fantastic. March 28th, we have Dr. Uh, Jeff Williams from Auburn University. He manages the Bee Informed Partnership, and he's going to talk about the National Law Survey. Um, and so this gets updated each month. And it's people from USDA and a bunch of universities from the south, southern part of the U.S. Oh, that's um, fantastic. Including yeah. students and, and former people from my lab. So that's another way that you can learn more about what we do. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, Juliana. Um, yeah. Now, are you happy to answer some of these questions we've got in the chat? Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, so the first question was about successful commercial beekeepers. Are there any in the US who are chemical free or is using me mechanical IPM measures not financially viable on large scale? Um, Tony says, I hear of hobby beekeepers being commercial free, uh, treatment free, they call it, but use me mechanical IPM techniques of brood breaks and VSH gen genetics to beekeep successfully. The closest, so that basically that was a, a very well-worded question that gave away what I would have answered. Um, there are no commercial beekeepers, to my knowledge, that are totally chemical free because um, their livelihood depends on bees being alive and they can't take the risk of product not working. Even the less harmful chemical treatments like oxalic acid or formic acid um, require very stringent temperature ranges for efficacy to be uh, high enough to be worth applying and, and, and spending the money. So um, the answer is no. I don't think there's any or hardly any commercial beekeepers. The definition is people who have 500 or more colonies that are totally chemical free. They may be using combinations of amitraz, uh, oxalic acid, formic acid, mm -hmm. um, and then genetic lines, right? The uh, varroa sensitive hygiene, um, or any of the, or the Russian, uh, you know, hybrid. The problem with uh, a breeding program is because honeybees open mate, you dilute your um, genotype with the preferred um, genetics really quickly if you don't continue your efforts with the breeding, which is quite expensive and, and time um, consuming. So you can't really have just an all chemical free genetic, um, I mean, you potentially could, but not to my knowledge, not, it's, as you just said, mechanical IPM technique, genetic line, less, less harmful chemicals are probably mostly utilized by sideliners and or backyard beekeepers. Thank you, Juliana. And Tony has a backup question as well, asking, do Varroa Destructor carry all viruses and not just some of them? And also, do we know in Australia what viruses the Varroa Destructor is carrying? 
Um, uh, that's uh, actually a really good question. I don't know what virus it is carrying. I suspect in Australia that is, it is um, carrying at least the form wing virus. So it is the um, Verot does carry pretty much depends on what you consider all viruses because each year we hear from a new virus and it's not that it's new, it's just that we just sequenced it, um, but it was always present. Um, the form wing virus actually now has, we've identified three variants. So it will be very interesting to see if the form wing virus A, B, or C is what is um, going to be associated with Varroa in Australia. Um, but yes, they carry not just a form wing, they carry um, uh, other bee paralysis viruses and uh, Lake Sinai virus and um, almost every adult virus. Um, I don't know that they carry um, sac for, for example, but they, or black queen cell virus, very low incidence of that. Mm. But they carry several honeybee associated viruses for sure. Yeah, okay. Um, thank you. That for would answering. be very interesting to see what happens with the virus loads pre and post Varroa in Australia. It's, I mean, I, I feel really sorry. I think he, we all kind of knew that it was a matter of when, not if Varroa yeah. um, arrived to Australia. We are now um, awaiting anxiously the probably the incursion of tropilalip mites into yeah. the U.S. And that will probably be completely devastating. And so I'm really hoping that Australia can learn from other countries that got Varroa way before them and learn from our mistakes so that you can better approach this devastating honeybee parasite. And it sounds like Dr. Mary Whitehouse, in collaboration with you, is going to be doing some interesting re research in that area. And um, it might be worth me reaching out to her as well and just seeing if she you would should. make herself available. Yeah, Absolutely. to have a chat. Um, yeah. We're hiring, we, I mean, a part of the research group, she was the one that procured the funding. Um, she is hiring a postdoctoral research associate that's starting in April, who's going to lead this project. Um, it's a one year project that hopefully yeah. be, will. Um, will turn into more funding opportunities. But again, it's to identify the best management practices for Varroa control in Australia. Um, yeah. Which is from, very important at this point from, in history. <laughs> from the lens of an IPM specialist. Yeah. That has yes. done this for other pests. Um, so I that think we don't rely as heavily on the harsh chemicals. Yeah, no, that'll be good. I'll definitely reach out to her as well and just see who we can chat yeah, to. And the, the other, and the other huge area of research will have to be, unfortunately, um, the discovery of, of other alternative varroa control methods, chemical mm -hmm. met, met methods with different chemistries and modes of action. Because if there's any indication that the pattern will continue, we will we'll continue to see amitraz resistance. And when that happens, we don't have anything approved right now that's efficacious enough at high enough uh, rates in the U.S. Not even oxalic acid reaches um, the levels that we need for Varroa to be at bay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Juliana, for your time. I'm just, uh, we've got another comment Definitely interesting times here. If Varroa destructor does get away from us, it would be great to be able to start with best practice measures and learn from other countries. Thank you for your time, Juliana. And I think I can You're reflect welcome. that we really appreciate yeah. you speaking with us. I highly encourage you to um, reach out to Mary and the team because, again, part of part of this is to start communicating with the beekeeping industry in Australia and other countries. Um, and incidentally, part of this is that the working group will be gathering together sometime at the end of this year in Australia. So if I make it out there, I will reach out to you because yeah. then we could 
potentially do some live uh, talks yep. or something. That would be fantastic. Uh, well, that's what I was going to offer is that, you know, we've got a great network of women that we're connected with, but not just women, beekeepers everywhere. So whatever we can do to help get your research out there and the very important work that you're doing to provide us with factual information to help us be better beekeepers and to help the survival of bees, then we are 100% on board. Great. 100%. So, I, I mean, I'm yeah. all for encouragement of, and I, I saw your website when it said encouragement of women and girls into beekeeping uh that's that's wonderful and I'm, I'm i love seeing the pictures and i also saw your report that has beautiful pictures um and um activities that you've been doing so um i definitely reach out when i thank you if and when i go to australia next it's a beautiful i've never been to tasmania um would love to go one day good but, reason to um, come you know someone here now and i'm going to be sending you leatherwood honey so i look forward to connecting with you over honey and through your research yes, Julia. Thank, thank you for you. your time i'm going to no stop problem. the recording yeah no i really appreciate